arthritis is something that is afflicting many people today. It's inflammation of the joints. There is rheumatoid arthritis and it's probably a little bit more serious. And there's also osteoarthritis and arthritis. Also a similar condition which probably afflicts men mostly is gout. So what I'd like to look at in this presentation is what's the cause of arthritis? So remember Newton's third law of motion that to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. In other words, there is always a cause. And many are sick today through ignorance. That's why I like to go by Ellen White's in her little book, Ministry of Healing, one of my first books, Page 127, she says, the only hope of better things is the education of people in the right principles. Many are sick through ignorance. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you what some of the causes are and how you can get a turnaround in arthritis, whether it be osteo, rheumatoid arthritis, and also gout. And that's the good news. There, there can be a turnaround and we've seen many conquer these things. Arthritis thrives in a very acid environment. So an acid environment in the body is one of the number one causes of arthritis. Now, you can go back to look, old injuries is often where arthritis can manifest itself. And there can be different factors there. There can be an inherited factor. There can be a factor of injury to that area, which makes it a little bit more susceptible. There can be an acid environment. Often a breaking of these laws, as Ellen White says, that disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that arise because of a violation of the laws of health. And many people don't realize that. So I'd like to go through how a breaking of these laws could be a big contributing factor in arthritis we're seeing today. And I'd like to show you how restoring adherence to these laws can bring about a conquering of arthritis. So we're going to first of all look at pure air and we've looked at this a few times. We're going to go to the cell where the glucose goes in. It goes through a 20-step pathway and the 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. It's the glycolytic pathway. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into the powerhouse, called the powerhouse because this eight-step pathway delivers to us 36 units of energy. This is the mitochondria, and inside that little pathway is called the Krebs cycle because of a Sir Ernest Krebs that first discovered it and named it. Now the difference is oxygen. This is an anaerobic pathway because it does not use oxygen. It uses the process of fermentation to produce energy. This eight step pathway is called an aerobic pathway because it uses oxygen to produce energy. When every single cell in the body has enough oxygen to be giving that much energy, and we have a one, 100 trillion cells in our body, and even though I've drawn that as if there's one pathway per cell, that is actually not true. Especially in muscle cells, you can have even hundreds of little mitochondria. So just look at the potential of energy in a body that has a well oxygenated body. Oxygen is vital for the healing of the body and oxygen is an alkaline substance. So the alkaline, let's make a list of alkaline substances, is oxygen. Arthritis thrives in an acid environment. So just that one simple step to begin with, oxygenating the body, can make a difference with arthritis and gout and any form of arthritis. And the most powerful way to oxygenate the body is exercise. So let's go straight over to the fifth law because that's intimately connected with oxygen. Yes, you will 
ensure more oxygen's going in when you sleep with your windows open, when you have a, a bedroom. You see, we spend a third of our life in that room, so it's absolutely vital that you ensure that you've got fresh air in that bedroom. But exercise increases in a dramatic way the amount of oxygen going into your body. Right now, while you're sitting watching this presentation, you're breathing in 500 ml of air and you're breathing out 500 ml of waste. But when you're exercising, especially to the point of breathing very, very deeply, you're breathing in 3,600 ml of air and three, breathing out 3,600 ml of waste. So exercise increases the oxygen and in that way can alkalize the tissues. And what exercise does is it moves blood. We've looked at blood a few times this week. Remember what blood contains? It carries the oxygen. What blood does is carry the water. What blood also does is carry the nutrients. And this is what every single cell in the body needs to be able to not only function, but also to heal. Blood also carries away waste. Carries away, carries away the waste. So if you can increase the blood supply to any part of the body that's not working, arthritic joints, arthritic toes, arthritic joints anywhere in the body, if you can increase blood to that area, you will increase healing in that area. And water is an alkalizer. We're going to look at foods in a minute. We're going to look at the foods that have an alkalizing effect and the foods that have an acid effect. And waste is acid. So getting blood into the joints of an arthritic or a gout person, you're immediately bringing in two powerful alkalizers, which is the oxygen and the water. And you're carrying away one of the biggest acidic forming substances, which is waste. Every body fluid in our body should be alkaline, and it, and it is, except for the stomach. That should be acid because we need the acid to break down our food. That's how protein breaks down, under the effect of the acid enzymes in the stomach. It denatures the protein or breaks it down to smaller particles. So your stomach should be acid and everything else alkaline, but the waste as it comes out, all your body's waste has an acid effect. So moving blood into the area is vital in the recovery of arthritis. And the person might say, you don't understand, Barbara. My body, I'm in so much pain, my body can't move. We've well, got to find out how to make it move. And one of the easiest types of exercise for someone who has stiff, painful joints is swimming. What swimming does is it's weightless, so that can be good. And you can start moving the body in the pool. And if you can't swim, you can get a kickboard or you can stay near the edge, but you've just got to move that body. That body must move. Another non-jarring exercise exercise is the rebounder and you can start with the rebounder just this what I'm doing right now is called the health bounce and you can do that on the rebounder and on the rebounder you've got a, a springing action you've got a, a shock absorber action in, in that mat and as you master the art of the health bounce then more and more you can start jumping a little bit more another low impact exercise because with painful joints you you don't want impact another very low impact exercise is the exercise bike especially good for people who are a little they don't balance very well but what the rebounder does so we'll look at the rebounder here the rebounder it stimulates your lymphatic system and your lymphatic system stimulates the removal of waste from the body. The lymphatic system is your internal, it's your internal vacuum cleaner. And part of 
a proper functioning body is eliminating the waste. Isn't that part of a proper functioning house? You eliminate your waste every day. You've got to get that waste out of the house. Well, that's what your lymphatic system does. Your lymphatic, your, your lymphatic system sweeps away waste from the tissues and dumps it into, it can be eliminated out via your skin in perspiration. It can be urinated out and it can come out via your colon. So they're the organs of elimination that, that are the most prominent eliminating waste. We've got to get that waste out because it's an acid waste. So the lymphatic system cleans the waste from the tissues, dumps it into the blood, and then the blood carries it away to the organs of elimination. So that process is vital in arthritis because remember, we, we're trying to alkalize the joints, alkalize the body. When blood rushes into those arthritic joints, it's bringing life to the area. It revives the area. And exercise moves the blood. The other thing that moves the blood, and we talked about this in our pain presentation, is hot and colds. So hot and cold application. So the hot and cold applications can be done by immersing the hands in, in little bars for hot and cold or bowls. It can be immersing the feet. If it's in the hip area, then hot compresses alternated with cold compresses can be used. And that can be hot towels twisted and dipped it in, into boiling water and then twisted, wrung out, folded over. You always put, say it's the hip, you always put a dry towel there and then put that hot, hot steaming towel there and then put a blanket over it. If it's too hot, lift it up and just wipe the skin put it down, keep putting it down till the person can, can handle the heat. And then you, you leave it there for three minutes. So it's three minutes hot and 30 seconds cold. After three minutes, things start to slow down with the hot application. And so then you take the hot off and go over to the cold. And after 30 seconds, things start to slow down. So you're, you're using the stimulating effect of, of your hot and colds. So the three minutes hot and the 30 seconds cold, that's, that's the, the stimulating times. And you do this three times. So again, that's a powerful mover of blood into the area. And what you will also find is that can bring great relief to, arth to pain in arthritic joints. We're alkalizing the area. We're aiming to get more blood into the area to bring more healing. To ensure that the blood has enough water, it's important to drink adequate water. So water, eight plus glasses a day. If you're used to three glasses of water a day, start drinking four, then start drinking five, and then start drinking six. A lot of people, especially elderly people, don't want to drink water because they don't want to have an accident or they don't want to have to rush to the bathroom and maybe not make it. So there is a way to drink water that will certainly lessen that. And that is little by little by little. Don't drink a whole glass at once. Drink a third of a glass at a time or a quarter of a glass at a time or a half a glass. Do an experiment one day and have a mouthful of water every five minutes and just see how much water you, you consume in a day just by doing it little by little by little by little. So the water is important to drink and the water is also important out and that's your hydrotherapy. Also, people may find that they can do this hot and cold in the shower, especially if you have a shower head that you can move. If it's the hip, you can do hot, cold, hot, cold, you can move it around like that. So looking at what alkalizes, we're also looking at food. So what are the most alkalizing foods? So we're gonna make an alkaline list of foods and an acid list in foods. By looking at this acid alkaline list, you can determine what is the best foods for arthritis and what are the worst. The most alkalizing is the humble lemon 
And the lemon is acid where it should be and it's alkaline where it should be. Acid in the stomach to help you digest your meal. But when it's uh, broken down in the gastrointestinal tract and the minerals are absorbed into the tissues, the minerals are an alkaline forming mineral. So this is the sodium and potassium and calcium and magnesium and iron. So the lemon is high in the alkalizing minerals. Dark green leafy vegetables. Dark green veg leafy vegetables are very alkalizing. We should be eating dark green leafy vegetables every day. So someone might ask, well, what about cooked spinach? Spinach is high in oxalic acid and in its raw state, the oxalic acid is in, is in a organic state, so it's alkalizing. But when you cook silver beet or spinach, the oxalic acid now is in an inorganic state and it can have an acid effect. So people who have arthritis or gout, they're best to keep to the raw cabbage. Maybe they have a cooked cabbage dish occasionally, but that's the only green that will that will turn because of the oxalic acid in it when it's cooked. Also vegetables. Vegetables have an alkalizing effect but for the arthritic person there are a few vegetables that can have an acid effect and that's bell pepper. So when someone's wanting to conquer arthritis the bell pepper must stop. Tomato Tomato can also have an acid effect on someone who's suffering from gout or arthritis. Uh, eggplant, sometimes called aubergine, and also the potato. And I'm referring here to the English potato. The Fijians call it the white man's potato. I'm not referring to the sweet potato. The sweet potato is not a potato, it is a yam. So these can have an acid effect on the arthritic person. If a person doesn't have arthritis, um, they often can eat, eat this class of vegetables. But if you're wanting to conquer your, your arthritis, your gout, these things have to stop. Not forever, it's just till you've conquered it. Also fruit, fruit is alkalizing. Millet. Millet is an alkaline grain, as is quinoa, as is buckwheat. Buckwheat is also an alkalizing grain, or an alkaline forming grain, and spelt, and kamut. These are alkalizing grains. There's another one called Enkenhorn, so any of your ancient ancient grains from the ancient wheat have an alkalizing effect. Almonds are the alkalizing nut and Brazil nuts. They're the two alkaline forming nuts. And regarding legumes, the lima bean and lentils and soy. And again, the soy must be organic non-GMO. All your seeds, they also have an alkalizing effect. The most acid food that can go into the body is the pure crystallized acid that's extracted from the sugarcane plant. It is incredibly acid, it's a pure acid. Also meat, Dr. Colin Campbell in his book uh, China Study, he shows how he could turn cancer cells on and off by the amount of meat and dairy products that he was giving them because cancer loves an acid environment. These acid foods are high in the acid forming minerals which is chlorine and phosphorus and sulfur. When meat breaks down in the body it gives off a high sulfur waste. So it's particularly acid forming is the meat. Also the hybridized wheat of today. The wheat was hybridized in the 50s 
It went through intensive crossbreeding. It was rushed through. No safety studies were done. They didn't think they had to do safety studies on just wheat. <laughs> but the effect of it has been seen today. So many people are gluten intolerant. And one of the reasons is the hybridization of the wheat created an incredibly complex protein or gluten structure. So it's very difficult for the gut to break down. And it is higher in the acid forming minerals. And when that wheat is grown with superphosphate, chlorinated water, so all of these conditions bring it together to make it more acid forming. And most wheat today is grown with uh, glyphosate or Roundup, so there's more acid forming because all your chemicals have an acid effect. So your aged cheese, your aged cheese is very acid forming. So the only, che the only cheese that doesn't have an acid effect would be things like your goat feta or sheep feta. That they are basically uh, on a neutral. Caffeine has a very acid effect on the body. Alcohol, not a food, but it certainly creates an acid environment. Tobacco, not a food, but it also creates a very acid environment. All your other grains, other than the millet, quinoa, buckwheat, spelt kamut, and also all your other legumes, other than lima, lentil, and soy, and all your other nuts, other than your Brazil and almonds, have an acid effect. To maintain a six-point environment at the cellular level, we need to be taking probably 20 to 30% acid-forming foods. And this explains why, because some people see this and say, does that mean I can't eat rice? Well, you can eat rice. Yes, it is an acid grain, but you need a little acid. So it's not that they're totally out, but this 20 to 30% ideally should come from this little section here. And we should be having approximately 70 to 80% alkaline forming foods. What that will do is that will maintain the cellular pH conducive to recovering from arthritis. See, the blood pH never, never changes. Your lungs and your kidneys are constantly working to keep the blood pH in the area that it should be. But the cellular pH can change and your cellular pH is influenced by the breaking of these laws. It's, it's influenced by dehydrated, it's influenced by lack of oxygen, it's influenced by a very acid diet. Then the cellular pH becomes more acid and that is where arthritis and gout like, like to thrive. We've got to get alkalinity into those joints. And when your blood is carrying the food that is more alkaline that's an, than it's a contributing to the alkaline or less acid environment around the joints. So the food, so we'll put an, a little red arrow indicating that over there is the, is the food that will help to conquer arthritis. We had a lady come and do our program her and her husband, they were in their, or oh, they were probably in their mid-70s when they came to uh, attend our program. And they had an interesting story. The lady said, we were both in our late 60s. We both had arthritis. We both were a little overweight, finding our house hard to manage. So we booked into an aged care facility. She said, our daughter gave us a set of your DVDs, Barbara. We watched the DVDs. And we discovered that a lot of what we were doing was contributing to our arthritis. So we made a decision to stop our morning cup of coffee. We made a decision to stop having our wheat cereal and our wheat toast with, with the coffee for breakfast. She said, we also made a decision to stop our little 
red wine every night. We made a decision to stop having the meat at night and start to have the main meal at lunchtime. We started to discover ways that we could make the legumes and we started to eat more fruits and vegetables. We also decided to stop the nightshade group of vegetables. So this is the night grape, nightshade group of vegetables here. She said, as time went on, we're also drinking more water. We started to exercise every morning. She said, within six months, we both had lost, now I'm putting this over to American terms, so it was 20 kilos they'd lost in six months, so that's 40 pound. She said, we also found that just losing the weight had also taken the pressure off our knees and our, and our feet. She said, we both noticed that we didn't have the pain in our joints anymore. She said, I found that even my swollen joints were starting to go back to normal. We went to the doctor for our checkup and he said, I, I don't know what's happened to you, <laughs> to, to you as a couple, but, but the doctor said, your inflammatory markers have come right down. And they both testified, well, we, we really don't have pain anymore. And so the doctor took them off their medication. He took them off their anti-inflammatories. They didn't need it anymore. And once they stopped the medication, they felt even better. And they looked at each other after a year and they said, well, what, what are we doing in this aged care facility? <laughs> so they booked out, they bought a caravan and a four wheel drive and they decided to drive around Australia. And when they got halfway up the East Coast, they came in an hour and they attended a program at Misty Mountain Health Retreat. This lady had a smile on her face the whole time. She said, it's like I've got a new lease on life. She said, I, I, I just can't believe how good I feel. She said, we, we both believe that we feel better now in our early 70s than we felt in our 40s, our 50s. How, how many people aren't really living? How many people are suffering from conditions when there is a remedy. So she said what we also did, not only did we uh, stop all the things that have an acid effect, and of course those, they, they come into this area here, but she said we also started to go to bed earlier. We started to limit our television watching. She, we started to eliminate as much as possible our exposure to technology. That has an acid effect. We started exercising the proper diet, use some water. She said we also started to read our Bible. We found that our minds came clearer and she said we began to learn about the God of heaven who made the body to heal itself. She said we read about how we should be presenting our bodies living sacrifice. She said we had never seen these things before. So this is another effect that the change in the lifestyle and diet had done. It gave them clearer minds. At our retreat, she learned a few more things. She didn't need them as much now, but she said, I have friends who have arthritis. She said, the hot and cold certainly can make a difference, but we've also got poultices. And these poultices can get that acid, that inflammatory out of the body. And one that's particularly helpful is the ginger poultice. Ginger is great for joints, especially inflamed joints. So what you do is you just grate that ginger very fine and you Take a cloth, maybe you have a cloth this big, and you put the grated ginger into the middle area and then you fold it over, I call it um, east, west, north, south, and you make a little package. And when you've made your package, here's your package, and then you just have a little bit more plastic, plastic around it that covers it, or I should go, say it goes under it, and so it's applied to the wrist with the plastic over and then it can be bandaged on. And we have found many people have testified that it draws the inflammation out of the skin to the point where it, it almost feels like the skin's burning, but it doesn't burn. So a ginger poultice, and that's 
excellent for painful joints. And remember, it is quite a powerful anti-inflammatory, uh, has a powerful anti-inflammatory effect. We had a lady uh, attend one of our programs and she had a very swollen finger joint. She said, this finger has been hurting me for about a year and she could not bend her finger. It was so painful. And she said, I'm right-handed. It interferes with my ability to write, to, to prepare food, to sew. She said, it's, <laughs> she said it, it's really difficult, but she said, I'm in my late 60s now. I guess, you know, I'm getting arthritis. How many people think that, that they're getting into their late 50s, 60s, so these sorts of things are gonna happen? But I can tell you now, we've seen people totally free from them. So we put a grated ginger poultice on her, and of course that was a little tiny one that we put on her, on her finger. The next morning she came in and she said, I have no pain in that finger. She said, I even slept all night. When I was going to sleep, it was feeling very hot. She said, and I wondered if I'd be able to sleep because it felt so hot. But she said, I, I went to sleep. And she said, in the morning, it didn't feel hot anymore. And when I took the poultice off, she said, I could bend my finger. The swelling wasn't totally down, but it certainly was almost halfway down. Just a very simple little ginger poultice. Now, I do warn people, don't put it on just before you go to bed because you might wake in half an hour with your skin very, very hot where the poultice is and that could interfere with your ability to sleep. So I suggest people put the ginger poultice on and put it on, just choose one painful joint where you put it on and just see how it feels. Maybe you'll put it on at 6 o'clock and you're going to bed at 9 o'clock. See how it feels by 9 o'clock. If it's just too hot, take it off. Even, even that amount of time, it will have an effect. And remember that hot skin is an indication of the inflammation that it's drawn out of the joints and to the skin. One lady did it too much. She did it overnight. She did it the next day to the middle of the day, changed it again, did it to the evening, then and did another one overnight. And she did it to her knee and she said, she was so excited because it reduced the pain in her knee right down. So just, she just wanted to keep doing it. And then she sent me a picture of her knee. The tissue was red, and swollen, and she had blisters on the skin. She said, what have I done? I said, you've just overdone it. I said, no more ginger poultices for another week. She said, I can handle that because my knee is certainly moving a lot better. I said, you, you might like to just put castor oil compresses, and that's another one that can be used as castor oil. Castor oil doesn't have as dramatic effect as the ginger poultice, but castor oil can be used almost indefinitely. You could almost wear it 24-7. Castor oil penetrates very, very deep, and it, it, can, it can break up scar tissue. It can also break up uh, calcifications and sometimes with arthritis you've got calcification, calcified joints. Now, so we'll say calcifications because this is some of the cause for the pain in the joints. So the, the scar tissue obviously is going to break up a little bit easier than the calcified joints but eventually it will do it. The key is consistency. Just keep at it. Just keep applying it every day, every day. Some people like to sleep with the castor oil compress overnight. Now the thicker the compress, I like to do about six layers of cloth or maybe three layers of toweling and I stitch it together and we put plastic underneath it. See, when you apply it, let's say you're applying it to the knee, you apply it and then you put the plastic over and then you'll bandage it on. The plastic just keeps the compress from chilling as it does with the ginger and it also protects your clothes from being soiled from the castor oil or if it's the ginger, the ginger juice. The castor oil can be used, the castor oil compress can be used again and again and again and again. You might even use it for a month. By then it might be looking a little bit sad and, uh, 
and you might make a fresh one. I'll, I'll leave the decision up to you. Because the castor oil is not drawing anything out of you. It's just a vehicle to hold, hold the oil so that it can go into you. So this is a gentler, gentler poultice, but it's actually quite powerful. It, it can break up a bone spur. And so cal calcification, calcified, any calcification anywhere in the body, it has the ability to break that up. Remember, it penetrates deeper than any other oil. And wherever it penetrates, it has the ability to break up the congestion scar tissue calcification in that area. The, the more serious the condition, of course, the longer it's going to take. And the longer it's been like that, the longer it can take. So the swollen joints, you might, you might do the, the ginger poultice for a few hours, and then you might do the castor oil overnight every night. So play with them. Remember, you're the doctor. Listen to what your body says. If it brings relief, do it. If it doesn't bring relief, maybe you need to do it for a little bit longer. Maybe you'd need to adjust the times that you do it. But, but your body will speak to you and it will tell you what it likes. And if, if you don't get the results straight away, just keep at it. Remember Galatians 6 verse 9 where the Bible says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. And remember that God gave us these simple natural remedies and God blesses those natural remedies. So always pray for your, for your poultices and ask God to bless them. And then you'll have the help of the greatest teacher, the greatest physician, the greatest healer that this world has, has ever known. In fact, the Bible says in some towns, once he passed through, there was not a sick person in that town. Can God still heal? Of course he can still heal. But I believe that what he wants to do is he wants to teach people why they're sick and what they can do to recover from their sickness. And when they go through that experience, they are now qualified to be able to help others because the most powerful testimony is, is your testimony. In uh, Revelation 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So your testimony is a powerful testimony. No, no one can, uh, can argue against your testimony and what you have found has helped in your life. So this lady and this man who conquered their arthritis, then came in to our retreat. They'd conquered it by basically implementing everything that I've shown you here. They, now long, they no longer had arthritis. And the lady said to me, can we start to eat some of the nightshade foods? Could we start to maybe eat a little bit of wheat? And I said to her, your body will tell you. One lady said, but I love these foods. I said, how much do you love your arthritis? It's not forever. It's like what this lady testified. Once she'd implemented all of this and her arthritis was conquered, her, she is now in a situation where she thinks, hmm, I'll give it a try. And this is what she found. She found that she could eat half a tomato three days a week. She found that she could eat a small potato most days. Her body told her not to touch the bell pepper and the eggplant. She said, I might have that once a month. It's not a food we eat a lot of. She said, and the wheat, she said, I was out at a restaurant and I had some pasta that was made of wheat. She said, I had no reaction. So the next day I had another dish. We were traveling of pasta and she said, I started to get some little bit of little bit of um, twinges in my joints. So can you see what her body was saying to her? You can have a dish of wheat pasta maybe once a week, but not every day. You see, no, no man can tell you what your body can tell you. My mother died a cripple in a wheelchair at 51 with rheumatoid arthritis. She had severe arthritis. She was she was only five stone when she died and her hands were all cramped up. Her, her knees were twice as wide as mine. Her feet, she could not walk anymore. 
Little by little by little, the arthritis had taken over her body. Now, my mum loved cups of tea and she had three cups of tea a day and she always had some milk and some sugar in her cups of tea. She always had white toast for breakfast. She always had sandwiches for lunch, white toast with cheese on it, sometimes white toast with ham on it. She also, for tea every night, had chops or sausages and mashed potato and maybe some frozen peas. And sometimes they would have ice cream. Can you see that my mum had a diet that just fed her arthritis? She didn't know. My dad didn't know. I was just a teenager at the time in my early 20s. I didn't know. But something triggered mum's arthritis. My dad made a decision to start a new business, which my mum was not really happy about. But my mum agreed reluctantly. And my mum carried some resentment because she did not want to move. She didn't want to leave the house that she'd lived in for so long. So she reluctantly moved. And my mum held on to this anger. In fact, when she passed, my dad took his five children aside and he told us these things. He told us as an illustration because he did not want his children to go through what his wife had gone through. And dad believed that a large part of mum's illness was due to her emotional state, that she, she was angry and bitter and resentful at having to move but she just did it, but she carried that with her. Within six months of moving into the new business and the house that was attached to it, she got pains in her joints. Within one year, um, she basically was in a wheelchair. My mother went to the doctor, as it's all we knew then. They put her on cortisone. They put her on anti-inflammatories. And then there were times when my mum had to come off this medication because the doctors knew it was harming her, her, her internal organs. And then we went through watching my mum go through terrible withdrawals. And I was, I was working as a psychiatric nurse at the time and I was working in an operating theatre. And I saw the surgeons do surgery on hands to free up um, clamped up joints. And I told my mum and my dad and they arranged for mum to have surgery to try and free up her hands that were like this. It really didn't do very much, unfortunately. And then when mum was really crippled in, in a wheelchair, my, my partner and I, we moved to an area where there were Seventh-day Adventists. I'd never heard of a Seventh-day Adventist. And the people next door were Seventh-day Adventists and they had a visitor named Daisy. Now Daisy was a lovely lady. She was probably in her 60s. I was in my early 20s at the time. And I met Daisy and we talked and I told her about my mum and she said, I think we can help your mum. I said, really? How? how? She said, well, I have a team and we do natural remedies and I believe we can help your mum. I immediately rang up my dad. I said, Dad, I have just met a woman who believes she can help mum because we really had exhausted the medical way. There was nothing else that they could do for my mum. So my dad flew straight up to where Daisy lived in Queensland. He talked to Daisy and he talked to her, her partner in the business called George and dad was convinced that they could help my mum. And so we flew mum up. Mum stayed with them for six weeks. By the end of the six weeks, mum was off all her medication and she was pain free. It was just incredible. All of our kids, because we're, you know, we're in our teens and 20s, my brother was 27, I was 25, and then my three sisters down to my younger sister, who was about 17 at the time. We, we were just amazed. We, We'd never heard of natural remedies. We, we'd never heard of such a thing. But we saw what happened with mum. Mum became pain free. Mum was off all her medication. Now it was time to build up mum's body. 
<laughs> mum's body was deformed and weaked. And when Daisy talked to my mum about building up her body and starting to do simple exercises like squeezing a ball and getting some strength into her hand, my mum was not cooperative with this. So Daisy rang my mum and she said, uh, we can do no more for your mum we, or your wife. We've got her pain free. We've got her off her meds. It, Maybe you could uh, put her in a place that does exercise and show her how to build up her body. But my mum was not interested. Two days after they brought my mum back, um, my mum died in the night. We think that my mum maybe even willed herself to death. It, it, it was a very difficult experience for all of us. And my dad changed his whole life from what he saw happen to my mum. He went to a health retreat, he went on a seven day uh, cleanse, and from that health retreat, he was 51 too, he has never eaten meat again. He had a total change in his lifestyle because of what he saw happen with mum. It had a dramatic effect on me. Uh, I'd already become a vegetarian, and it was six months after mum passed that I surrendered my heart to God and became a Christian. I was very interested in the Seventh-day Adventists because I found that they keep to the Bible. I discovered the truth of what happens when you die, which excited me because I thought mum was floating around watching me. And when I read what the Bible said, 52 times in the Bible, the Bible calls death sleep. And then I realized my mum wasn't floating around watching me. She was asleep. I read about the second coming of Jesus. I read about the truth of the Sabbath. And I also read about our bodies have been designed to heal themselves. So I never realized that here we are years and years later that I am doing the very things that Daisy did to my mum. I'm doing the very things that... Uh, my family and I, we had never heard of. And this is why it is a very real message to me that I believe if my mother had realized at a younger age the things that are contributing or contributed to her illnesses and also the freedom that God gives even in the resentments that we can carry. He says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lonely of heart, and you will find rest under your souls. And I realize that my mum could certainly have experienced freedom from the, from the resentment that she carried. It is a beautiful message. It is a whole message. So when you look at those eight laws of health, they are a whole message. I know that I have inherited tendencies to arthritis, and yet I also know what to do about it. And when I was probably 50, I fell running through the bush. <laughs> I fell and my arm came and took the brunt and that arm, it hurt. I put poultices on it, I did the hot and colds and it healed. But if I'm traveling a lot, my sleep isn't good. I try always to eat like this, but sometimes when I'm traveling, I might be having some wheat as more than I usually have. Maybe I'm unable to get good water. This elbow starts to speak to me. And when it starts to speak to me, I put ginger poultices on, I do the hot and coals, I maybe put comfrey cream on, comfrey has a growth stimulant, and usually within a week it's not speaking to me anymore. So this elbow that was damaged quite a few years ago now, I think this is where uh, the arthritis will establish itself if I don't do the right things. So I am so glad for this message. This message has brought freedom to me, it's brought freedom to my family, and it's brought freedom to thousands of people who have suffered from something that can be very debilitating, which is the arthritis and gout. And so I trust that from this presentation, you also 
will experience freedom and eventually be in such a body that's working so well that you will be able to share with others the beauty of this message, which again is freedom.